I'm Kelsey. I'm the Learning and Community Engagement Curator at the Burning Public Art Gallery. And I just wanted to do, do a cultural acknowledgement just uh, and respectfully acknowledge that we're located on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Sealex people. And uh, it's a really great honor to work and live on this beautiful land. And I'm super grateful to be here and super grateful to be here tonight with Morgan. So uh, I would like to tell you all a little bit about him. Uh, he's CV is really impressive, I'm not going to lie. So, uh, so Dr. Rocher, he graduated from McMaster University in 2004 with a combined honors BA in electronic multimedia and classical visual arts. So in 2010, Morgan completed his master's of applied digital media arts at Emily Carr University. And in 2019, completed a PhD in individualized robotic art from Concordia University. So Dr. Rocher is a webmaster, a programmer, a multimedia designer, coder, inventor, founder, consultant, biz tech innovator, and university instructor. He is currently an instructor in the Department of Creative, Creative and Critical Studies and Computer Sciences at UBCO. And so one last housekeeping thing to mention is um, we will be recording this talk. So at the very end, we'll have a Q&A period. So if you are not comfortable having your camera or microphone on at that time, just leave a question in the chat and I can relay it to Morgan. And that's also being said, if you have a dying question that you would like me to relay to him during his talk, feel free to enter it in the chat. I'll be monitoring it as we go. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give a warm virtual welcome to Morgan. Take it away. Hello, oh, thank you very, very kindly, Kelsey, and um, thanks for the invitation as well to the talk. Um, you know, I know we had a little hiccup with the first one, and I'm sorry, folks, I, I missed that one. Uh, um, I was a little bit late. You see, I thought it was an hour later, so this uh, a time change thing really gets to me, but uh, I'm hoping uh, to offer uh, a value today, um, especially for even people coming afterwards and, and seeing this. Uh, it will be the first time that I've said certain things about the way that I operate and uh, give some insights as to why I'm even doing any of this. Uh, and maybe that will uh, just sort of be a nice little exclusive that I can give here that will make up for my uh, mistake. Uh, first, I want to say that I have not given an artist talk in about five years. And that is because I've been working on this project that I'm going to uh, tell you about today. And it was very, very extensive and it's very complex. So it's going to be a dense a talk. But at the same time, I'm going to try and keep it lighthearted so we can understand these things, you know, uh, uh, that I'm trying to chase after. Uh, so I'm just going to share my uh, screen and um, go from there and just give a little, give a little bit of, uh, of information for you here. Back. Here we go. Can everybody see that? Hopefully, yes. Good to go. <laughs> Good to go. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today has mainly to do with my thesis research expressing tacit material sensations from roboscoping process by communicating shared haptic experience. Now that's a really ridiculous thing to say. It's very academic and it's very large. So I'm going to just talk about it from a very simplistic perspective, although I'm going to cover all the key ideas. Um, I'll welcome people to check out the PDF from the Concordia Library, uh, where, it's, where it is now available for reference uh, uh, from you know, the PhD process. So you can dive into all these little details that I'm going to talk about today on your own. And I don't have to make this an academic talk. Because <clears throat> um, see, the thing is, I'm a student first. And then I became a teacher. And the whole time I'm studying and doing art. And I'm a technologist. So all those things combined mean that I need to communicate. And I've kind of discovered that it happens through shared sensations, these expressions that we give. Not scientific expression, because it's a word used in science also, like when you mix two chemicals together and they express something, but uh, similar in the sense that when you put a bunch of things uh, together, an artwork, a viewer, and an experience, an expression occurs. So to try to try to get to the uh, bottom of that uh, today a little bit. But let me just start with um, 
what I'm talking about is essentially touch, but touch as a vehicle for communicating things which we cannot communicate otherwise. Uh, can't say it, can't write it down, can't do the other ways, you know, can't use the other vehicles of communication uh, to start with. So, so here's the big reveal. Um, I'm an orphan. And when I was a child, I spent a lot of time in the backyard. Uh, I was kind of, uh, this is before I became an orphan. And, and, and uh, you know, it was because my mother was a single mother of four. Uh, and she was a very busy person and she was getting her nursing degree as well as all. So I was left in the, uh, you know, care of my teenage uh, siblings who, you know, might not have been the most responsible at times and, you know, but they were great to me and there was lots of love, but I was in the backyard. And the way that I was kept um, busy was they would give me a box of nails and a hammer. And I spent weeks, maybe months, uh, just hammering a nail into a stump. Uh, which, of course, one would think is an insane activity. Uh, why do this at all? And especially, why give a child a hammer and a bunch of nails? Yes, for the record, I ate one of these nails. Uh, you know, but this was the 70s, so, or the 80s, rather, so nobody was too concerned. You know, this is give them something to do, and here's the tool. But what I didn't realize was happening was that I was making a connection to the world in a physical way that was quite unique. And I never lost that personal little connection, which I started to have with the world. And what I learned, you know, over time is that in order to connect, like in order for me to connect, it really involves empathy. One must empathize with something. And you cannot necessarily empathize unless you feel something. You need to have an experience to allow the gates of empathy to open and for you to be able to realize an expression. So anyway, we'll, we'll get more into that. But just one thing on the uh, thesis. Um, I'll just read you one line uh, uh, from it, which is, as a sculptor, I aim never to be divorced from the substance from which I came, that I interact with as I live, and to which I will return, earth materials, right? Uh, so just a teaser there, have a read. It's an interesting, I mean, everybody thinks their thesis is interesting, so I have to give that also. So what happened eventually is I ended up at McMaster University doing sculpture. And, um, you know, there I was studying with Graham Todd, my late mentor, uh, who really was an ins a huge inspiration in my life for understanding uh, all kinds of things about art and life. But here I am in the studio, you know, we're mixing up this big vat of stuff. And I was a very proud young, young sculptor, just constantly making things, uh, hundreds of things. But I'll just show two because I want to get into the stuff that comes after. But uh, this is an example of a kind of a sculpture I would make. So this three-quarter life-size life study, you know, this fellow artist. I got um, Nick Marquis and Bird Dwyer in there, uh, you know, making art and having fun and doing this thing. Uh, all the way up and into bronze, like all kinds of materials, like composite materials and, uh, you know, just every kind of material you could imagine has gone through these hands. Uh, and this is an example, uh, you know, I was young and so I, I, I thought a man could be a feminist and I made this silly piece. But look, the earlier works were something to int interesting in terms of conceptually, but more importantly, the materiality and the final piece. Here's a very sharp instrument, like this piece had to have styrofoam bits on the ends because it was so sharp that it stabbed several people. Uh, that's a physical thing. Like you go to touch this, you will get uh, cut. Now I have to just kind of really quickly go to the future where I'm at Emily Carr and I'm doing some other kinds of sculpture. I had to learn about robotics and I had to learn about programming and I had to figure out, oh, how do you do all this stuff? Uh, how do you, uh, you know, make something uh, advanced and interactive and interactivity came into it and so many growths happened at Emily Carr. Wonderful institution for, you know, um, you know I was under Ron Burnett there, uh, uh, President Vice Chancellor knighted at the time and you know I had such great access to the institution and such a great community there but essentially what I was doing in my master's was I was trying to prove the sensation of being stared at so like you know when someone's looking at you you feel that and you've got Rupert Sheldrick and others kind of you know make, quantifying that giving research to it I'm an artist but I'm a researcher I can do it but I have to understand 
um, where the sense of being stared at was proven, uh, you know, military personnel, spies, all kinds of accounts where he could actually get enough statistical information out there to give meaning to an otherwise subjective idea, the sense of being stared at, it's become an official sense. And what I did here is show that you can feel like you're being watched, even if it's just a bunch of fake eyes. Uh, and what happens here is you um, go through the gallery space and uh, the, this wall of eyes uh, of tracks your movement, watches you. So it's this kind of creepy group of people cast it from real faces, you know? So, and also studied and researched down to the point where I needed to understand just how much anthrop anthropomorphosis of the face is needed for us to feel eerie. And actually it just requires the cheeks, the eyes and the forehead. Uh, and even in just a frozen expression, as long as the eyes are moving. So all of that was researched and done to understand how can I explain something unseen because the things that are seen are interesting, but the things that are more interesting for me are the things that are unseen because they're huge players in our life. It's the things we've not yet understood. It's the oomph inside I can't give to you instantly. Oh, sorry, is that a question? Sorry. So, so, so from working in the internal and using electronics, and, and, and I got to the point where I was like, well, if, if we can have the sense of being stared at, what other kind of invisible things are going on? I got into building mind machines for a while. You know, these mind machines, they put you in a hallucinatory state, uh, you know, even though you're not on anything. And it's simply because a light is flashing in one eye, you know, faster in one eye than it is in the other. And your mind tries to make up the difference and suddenly you're straight up hallucinating. So I, I built it in such a way as you could still be seeing your environment, you know, put the lights on the periphery. And you, so you could hallucinate while going around. And, you know, of course, there's tons of research now on stroboscopic uh, light and, you know, binaural beats and all those kind of things. But this was a little bit of the early research uh, into how to make it an artwork because I could do all kinds of illusions without there being any image. So I literally could pull in the invisible into the visual space. You know, our minds are so amazing. Uh, but it's a bit of hokey too, because it's a chemical thing. So I'm now thinking to myself, well, I want to get closer to the body, right? Because that's where it happens. It's all chemicals. It's all in here. So, you know, it's somewhere near. So I ended up at Concordia University building robots for Bill Vaughn. Wow. I mean, I, I'm so thankful for all of it. Uh, but, you know, what's Bill Vaughn? Wild. I mean, I'm going into his studio and he's got 30 life-size robots just right there. And, you know, he's building this exoskeleton system and I got to build a huge portion of that you know and uh, even be in it for the experiments and experience it for the first time and be a part of that critique and wow so what I'm learning it, it, from his work is that you know there's not only a criticism of the technology overtaking or technology being a problem in the uh, you know movement forward towards uh, effective expression exchange you know instead of being part of the solution and so he's got a huge crit on that but you learn a lot about robotics and you learn a lot about the critical thinking in robotics and interactivity in art. And what that led me to was the project I'm gonna talk about a little bit today, which is uh, TouchBots. I mean, I couldn't think, you know, it's hard to think of a name for some of these things, uh, but essentially TouchBot is a two different artworks. The first one is a chainsaw robot that you see here. And the user's in the gallery space using video game controllers and the chainsaw robot slaps around, cuts through woods. It's really dangerous, but it's inside this bulletproof container. So it can't, like things are flying around, but like it doesn't hurt you. And the chainsaw has a, a high fidelity contact microphone. So it's kind of like holding onto it and getting all those little detailed vibrations and sends all those vibrations to your palm and the controller. So you're experiencing these vibratory, you know, embodied kind of like weird communications that could never be spoken. Only the materials can speak that language out to us through our hands, which is the natural eye for that, you know, exchange, sensory exchange. Uh, also the whole board moved up and down as massive movements went on. So you could get this kind of other force feedback, which uh, I started to sort of think, well, that's interesting, but you know, how could I bring that to the next level? Um, so what I ended up doing, um, actually, I just see if I can find the V2 here and pull it up. But what I ended up doing is uh, producing another uh, version of it 
where it was a desktop uh, experience um, and robots. So I don't know if I'll find it here, but here, I'll, you know what? I'll show you. I'll show you that just where I'm at here. Stop the sharing and I'll. I'll show you the robots back here. I don't have them um, operating for today. And um, you know, you can go and check out a link on all this stuff. It's all just on the web, you know, for, so you can get into it in detail. Uh, but uh, essentially it's these three robots here and you know, you would be using one robot and the others would work in synchronous fashion. I couldn't, okay, so here's the story about the robots for today. I actually wanted to get them working for today, but I gave my robot out to students last term uh, who did not make me aware that they reprogrammed it before giving it back. So I unboxed it and it was a different program. So I wasn't able to show it exactly. Um, uh, but essentially what it is, is that one robot is used by a controller. Another robot moves in synchronous fashion with it. So this user participant gets redefined. Is it really a student participant, other, or both artists in that case? Because we can push back on each other. And both of us sculpt the, using the tool, which is a third arm, which of course follows in synchronous fashion. So all three arms moving and two people acting in a harmonious dance, allowing for a push and pull. I can't communicate push and pull with my mouth in the way that I can, or words in the way that I can, with my hands. It's like literally holding each other's hands as something unfolds. And in the material space, that allows for a kind of connection to what I have kind of landed on in the invisible space, which is tacit knowledge. So this is fascinating. Of course, this, the tacit knowledge came out as a passion through the PhD research. And you know, I kind of figured out through my, you know, of course, great mentorship and, and getting into the scholastic activity of really drilling it down to how these things work in all kinds of ways. And, and discovering that tacit, so not tactile, it's funny, they sound similar. Tactile being, you know, uh, the tactility, a uh, sensation at the end of your fingers, uh, but tacit being the invisible. It's actually in my heart. But if I am to share my heart with your heart, it's difficult. This is an artist's dilemma. Our hearts bleed for the thing we can see or perceive that we, because we're, you know, we're the out of the box thinker. We're, we're that element of society that is meant to be different so that we can make observations not typically observed. And so given that responsibility of, of finding a way to, to, to communicate it, to connect with others and, and, and share with them that empathetic experience about what you're going through is really my life's passion. And so, you know, starting with just materials, because I didn't even know electronics really existed, and then getting to interactivity, because that's closer to the moment of exchange. It's not just a one-way delivery like what I'm doing right now, but it would be when the conversation starts, more like that, uh, a, a cyclical, interwoven, uh, totally connected conversation. Uh, so let me just uh, share screens again. I had a couple more things uh, to say, uh, but I'm really interested in, in the conversation. I know there's not uh, many of us here, but uh, we can certainly uh, get into some of this uh, so that I'm making sure that I'm really, uh, again, the frustration of, of communicating my passion for this. So um, our bot is leading me now. I'm just going to give you a bit of a, uh, 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 background and some details as to what I've learned and what has come out of this process. Uh, here's a group of children using the chainsaw. So that's another thing is, you know, children could use a chainsaw words that would otherwise be insane uh, and feel what that feels like and get that pre ever holding one. Um, but in order to understand tacit knowledge, or that is the knowledge that is incommunicable or difficult to explain, uh, you know, we kind of have to understand the difference between tacit communication and tacit knowledge because what I understand, what I compute, what I calculate and conclude from the information that's coming in is different than what you do. So even if we're having the same experience at the exact same time, there needs to be an acknowledgement of the different um, perceptions or receptions. And that will depend on experience. If I've never touched a piece of wood before and we're sculpting wood together uh, and the other person involved has been sculpting in wood for their entire life, then, uh, 
it's going to be a different sensorial experience because we have, um, you know, we develop neural pathways as we act. And memory can be contained in the body. It doesn't, like neurologically, it doesn't need to be contained in the, uh, 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 you know, in the brain mind paradigm synapse, et cetera. I'll give an example. You can be sitting there and if you're very uh, well versed in knitting because you've knit lots, you could knit while watching television and not really think much about the knitting because it's an autonomic process at that point. You have learned it, you have embodied it, you have become it so much that it doesn't need to be calculated, computed, thought about, or stressed about. It's just a natural. So imagine spending an entire lifetime sculpting, an entire lifetime dealing with electronics, and an entire lifetime trying to communicate. By that point, there will be a kind of sentience that is earned through experience. But that sentience can now be shared maybe even documented. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, after this research, you get researchers recording the information, giving it to AI bots, so that we can even have these conversations to and from and in between an AI environment. And that's all very possible. Or a database of touch. You know, if I'm an architect and I want to, um, you know, if I'm an architect and I want to feel what a certain material feels like in a certain region to kind of like pull myself into that space as I create, you know, that would be possible too. Um, but to go back to the intentions for ever making art at all, it's this being an orphan. It's this being a kind of a reject. You, it's difficult to empathize with others when you're different, right? So you have this, what I have is this need to try extra hard. And so that's why all these explorations really happen is you know trying to reach out trying to express all these uh, sensations into the world and i found that tacit the, the tacit knowing that is within which is a physical tangible thing it's it's embodied knowledge it's what my body has as a experiential record um in order to 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 have the most effective i've got so far empathetic communication and or transference of tacit experience uh it is, is through these robotics. Um, but uh, for the last decade, and this is another reveal going on just out of uh, apologies for being late last time, so hopefully people catch this recording, but um, it, it has occurred to me that human sentience is not necessarily my focus anymore because for the last 10 years, I've actually been studying um, greenhouse automation. And what I've come to understand now is that to understand how to interact with the natural world, uh, we must understand its sentience. Uh, it's just like if I'm going to engage in a responsible way with another person, it, do, it does me well to know a little bit about them so that I can approach their perception and it can be accessible. Otherwise, we're dealing with all kinds of uh, roadblocks that come up for whatever reason in, in each individual. So, so, so when we're talking about really connecting, all things are connected. And if I'm talking about a physical connection, well, that's even worse. So my feeling now, after all these years of, of looking at plants, is that there is a code within plants that is a certain sentience that if we understood, it would be just as empathetic an exchange as a tacit exchange through robots for making sculpture. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll just briefly on that because it's, it's just, just started uh, to come out. Uh, the research itself is old at this point uh, because, you know, you know, all this kind of technology been around for a while, but not like this. Uh, so just one example was this automated uh, greenhouse. Uh, you know, this was, you know, several years back now and I haven't, publicly documented all of this work, but uh, essentially this was a winter greenhouse uh, built on a balcony which, which survived the winter in rural Quebec. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever been to rural Quebec in the winter, but this is an accomplishment. Um, so this is where I'm coming from to learn what. And I took this photo this summer, which, which summarizes it for me uh, and really sort of tells the truth about where I'm going. So this image is uh, being communicated to everyone via light. And it is a uh, image of light. But there are meanings in here which take time to dissect and understand. 
And it's because there's a code. Why it's beautiful is because we instantly, autonomically, and almost naturally recognize the code. This is something that Chomsky might back up in linguistics. Uh, you know, there's a natural set of phonomes or whatever it is that we're born with, and we construct that into language, but we're actually born with a set of constructions. So we recognize the natural. Why? Because it's about survival, of course. You know, what is safe, what is not. But beyond that, like I like to say to, um, uh, you know, sometimes I get com into conversations with, you know, family about health and stuff. And, and you know, we talk about, oh, well, you know, this, this or that person is not in the hospital or not sick, so everything's fine. But that's, I don't like that. It's not fine just because you're not in the hospital. How healthy could you be? What is your maximum health? Like, and then make a gauge, not like when you're about to die and that's when you're good or not good. I mean, wow, what a, what a lowest, lowest common denominator we've chosen. So, so what's being communicated visually in front of us is absolutely phenomenal. And it's very rarely thought about. Um, I just wanna see if I can Google quickly. Um, uh, I have this, oops. No, you know what, I might be able to find it on the site first, because there is this one piece of uh, writing, I think, that summarizes what I'm saying right now um, uh, uh, in here and I, 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 in the website, and I, I recommend people check it out. It's called Body Charge. So I did a series of experiments where um, I wanted to see how my body receives electricity and uh, electromagnetic forces and what does it do with it, because there hasn't been a lot on it uh, in terms of us being a transceiver, lots about lots about how we emit, lots about how we can read those emissions, lots about how what goes on in our neurology, but not uh, how we can be a transceiver is a device which receives radio signals and outputs radio signals. It modifies the radio signal and outputs it. So I proved that in this study, uh, looking at, you know, the body's electrical charge, but I want to go to, a, you know, even mathematically, but I just want to go to this one uh, part of the proof. And it is that all of these visuals that you're looking at have a similar visual code. Don't care about anything else yet, for me. It is a natural expression of energy, period. Plants do it, the cardiovascular system does it, a bolt of lightning does it, and of course a close-up of uh, a picture of uh, this leaf will do it. These are not inconsequential for me, these visual connections, now that it's all about the physical connection. And so there is something in this code, in my opinion, in, in this future kind of direction, that informs us from nature and can somehow give us an empathetic experience. So that's where I'm working on now. Um, and sorry, I, 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 I know it's dense coming up to this point, but I, I just wanted to explain how passionate I am about the difficulty of expressing a creative expression, like something I truly feel or something I truly observe and want to share, how difficult that can be. I mean, I teach this more than a decade now, and all I've got for my students are these formulaic ways of knowing yourself and knowing the world and then trying to put together the pieces in terms of the observation to result. And, because it's a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, I want to say education has become an economically driven thing very heavily, then that tends to be what the content goes towards. So it's not necessarily about the pure form of expression itself, even if we're dealing with an art career where students are encouraged to become professional artists, right? Uh, so it's hard for people to just say, oh, fuck it, I'm going to do this, and I feel this, and, I, and I'm looking at this, and, I, and I'm excited about this, because there's the reason for doing that, or let's say the energy allowed for it, the space allowed for is kind of limited. But uh, uh, my feeling is that the closer that we can connect, not in a, uh, yes, in a, uh, you know, doing campaigns for, you know, a climate change and doing campaign, you know, trying to restructure the thought processes of, of, of everyone so that we have a more collective understanding, that's fine. But understanding is different than what I'm talking about. This kind of understanding, this tacit exchange is more than just a logical deduction which can be shared amongst people. It is a visceral, internal uh, uh, experience that one cannot deny. It's, I, don't, I don't deny that wood won't allow me to do a certain thing. 
It has autonomy in the process. It has a agency. It has a presence in the conversation. But you can't uh, communicate that without the experience. So like, I couldn't just sit here and tell you, well, you know, I think the sense of being stared at is, 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 is just something you make up in your head. Like, maybe it is, but you also might feel it. And then, you know, but if I can show it and I can say, well, here, walk in front of this thing. I don't have to say anything anymore. You have the experience. It's yours now. I don't need to uh, uh, manipulate your perception with my own uh, weak interpretations, even if I've been the one who, who created it, who put it together. Because your interpersonal experience becomes more important. And then after a while, the collective experience of that work becomes the kind of totality of it, if you really will. But no one has access to that. The, 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 the shared collective conscious experience is only possible because of all of the unique nodes. So it's, it's great that you know, we have all of these uh, individual uh, perceptions and, 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 and so on, because it allows for more connectivity. If it was all the same, the connection wouldn't occur. It's like in uh, electronics, okay? In electronics, if you have a charged body over here, like let's say whatever it is, and there's a less charged body over here, and you put a wire in between them, like a battery, if this is a battery, then current's gonna start to flow. But if it's the exact same charge, there no current's gonna flow, it's gonna be balanced. There will be no difference to exchange. The fact that we are different is the thing we need to celebrate the most because it allows us to exchange at all. Anyway, currently we're looking at uh, uh, nature in many different, well, that is to say the wilderness around us, the, the wild world around our architectural constructions. Understanding that can be through these logical deductions and shared campaigns and so on, and, and that will bring some form of empathy. But According to the tacit knowing, everyone has to build up their own actual whole energy around that and construction and knowing. So if I really want you to feel my pain about the forest going down and, and, and my experience being there and having that, perhaps if we extend this kind of physical interaction and body technology experience to plants and us, uh, we might be able to uh, have a more uh, holistic and embodied total and, I mean, truest possible that I can find, communication or exchange that will facilitate uh, uh, empathy, that will facilitate empathy. So um, that's uh, what I have to say about the journey. I'm more interested about what you all have to say, to be honest. Um, please, please uh, don't be intimidated to ask me any question of any level. Um, I'm excited about the conversation from any uh, perspective. Um, but essentially what I present to you is an artist frustrated at not being able to express the inner uh, feelings, uh, 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 you know, uh, and, and wanting desperately uh, to share in order to, uh, um, to have empathy. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so the floor is open if anybody wants to ask questions in the chat or turn on your microphone and uh, your video, you go for that. But I just think it's really interesting, and I think we had mentioned this before on a phone conversation, just this topic and then with what's going on in the world right now with COVID and then the lack of touch and that lack of connection and just interesting parallels that are being drawn. And well, I, I, I don't, don't mention or, a couple of cases. I mean, you know, when I first started doing this research, everyone said I should get into the adult toy industry because there's such a huge need for exchange and distance. And there's already a huge market there and huge, you know, so I was like, that's silly. But some of the research that I did was into an artist, for example, is a Japanese artist who did a buttocks and you, you're supposed to spank the buttocks and then it gives a reaction, the actual buttocks gives a reaction. So these are weird connections. But during COVID right now, like part of, okay, so my feeling is, because I've already studied the um, electricity from the perspective of uh, us being a transceiver, so that means when you're standing in someone's presence, you're, you're actually feeling them for real. Electronically, we all emit an electromagnetic radiation because our neurology is giving off electrical impulses. So when you say, I got a bad feeling about this guy or whatever, it's real. There is not necessarily a fakeness to that in the energy. But when you're so far away, I mean, I guess you're in Vernon, uh, we're here in uh, Kelowna, I can maybe imagine where you're at and direct an energy in that direction and try to make the same connection. But 
you know, perhaps not as powerfully when we're all in person. Um, that's one thing that's absolutely not discussed at all when it comes to, you know, the dialogue uh, with professors these days about the technology and is it failing or succeeding or how the metrics are simply economic. It's not about, you know, tacit exchange at all, which is exactly what happens in a classroom. The you know what I mean, the um, you can feel what I'm saying. All those things actually do get exchanged in a live environment, not only through, of course, micro expressions and body language, and, you, know, you know, intonation and all of those things, which are hard over a eight bit or 24 bit audio or whatever we're getting here, a signal, but the body, our bodies exchange energy, it's wild. Uh, they neutralize electronically when we shake hands. What an interesting tradition. And, and why did this, you know, you know, so we're neutral, good, now let's go. Energetically, right? Um, anyway, um, just all these kind of things. I really feel like um, COVID and the distance uh, that we're getting right now, I mean, I see it in my students, my poor, poor students. I, you know, I'm just trying to give them anything they can use to get through this because what a difficult thing to do, come into first year and not, you know, some of them and, and, and just have no tangible exchanges at all. There will be serious consequences for that. Uh, that we are unaware of yet. So but we'll just wait up for that. And there's lots of psychology backing this up right now. It's actually a trend, uh, this understanding of uh, tacit knowledge. Um, but yeah, COVID, bah. <laughs> I think Alexandra had her hand up. I don't know if she wanted to. Oh yeah, please. Was that Chloe? Uh, or? Uh, hey, uh, hey oh, Morgan. Hey. Uh, hey, hey. So, just wanted to, uh, maybe you covered this a little bit, but some of the experimentation that Nikola Tesla can transfer, um, like, you know, you have, uh, like we feel what each other feel, there's this kind of synchronicity between electrical signals, which is what the brain is operating on. Right. How do you think that's going to eventually kind of like fold into the robotics work that you're, uh -huh. that you're doing? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, it's funny because uh, I'm actually probably going to divorce robots pretty soon. Uh, you know, but, but Tesla is a good one. Thank you. Cause absolutely. Um, so, you know, Nikola Tesla, he comes along and, um, do a bit of reading on him, I think for everyone, because, uh, Tesla was actually one of these physical bodies that was like the Siberian electric man. I don't know if you've ever researched this, but check out the Siberian electric man. Very weird. He can actually hold on to like 120 or 240 volt current and go through his body. So here are examples of human beings that can pass that much current through their body. What would they understand? And what would they feel? So here you have Tesla come along and he's actually passionate about this, knows a little bit of math, kind of tried to be amongst, amongst the bourgeois with his fake fancy language, but so genius, why? Because he shared with us the feelings he had in his physical body, which was capable of doing things beyond the normal body. And only because it's this anomaly, apparently, uh, uh, amongst, uh, genetically amongst human beings. There are some that can and some can't. So like electric people can tell us about electricity, you know, kind of like uh, where, uh, you know, empathetic people can tell us about others and, and, and make you feel better as a therapist or whatever our skills are. Anyway, Tesla comes along and does similar, uh, all of what I do, any of my electronics research certainly comes from uh, Tesla, Marconi, Maxwell, uh, uh, Edison even, and even uh, 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 at the time, you go look at the picture in Niagara Falls with all these people together when they were doing this research, uh, uh, Einstein was there as well. So, you know, these individuals got together and tried to understand. And what they came to understand was about all of these electrical phenomena, but they did not have computers. They did not have robots. They did not have Zoom. They did not have the tools that we have now to expand the conversation. And I hold, as an electronics researcher, that there's not been any significant uh, research in the advancement, actual full-blown advancement of electronics uh, pretty much since uh, the computer, since the, uh, sorry, um, transistor. Uh, but the potential is huge. Because in quantum physics now, and in other domains, we're learning that it's possible to manifest matter, like physical matter. So let me, let me tell you why I'm really interested in plants. And this is just very fascinating. Is that photosynthesis is one of the least understood phenomena energetically out there. It involves this radiological exchange, uh, light and energy, but it's not just the nutrients and the, and the, and the, and the water and uh, all of this, which gives physical mass, size. 
there's a portion of the mass which comes from photosynthesis and nobody really knows the exact reason why. It means that matter, matter, you know, can be manifest. And that's exactly the exchange. So to understand that closely, energetically, will be to understand not only a sentience from a collective conscious human perspective, as though we're some sort of alien force landed on this earth. We come from the materials of this earth and we go right back to it. The percentage of water that is in your body relative to the percentage of physical matter, you know, you know, minerals, et cetera, et cetera, is the same ratio as the water per mineral uh, content of the planet. Our harmonic frequency is the same as the harmonic frequency as the planet, meaning these tele, communa, electra, conscious, yeah, English, that thing is all connected. Do we need cell phones to communicate? Are we that like limited? Or is it that we introduced cell phones and now we're limited? Because it's, it's perceivably easier. Don't you know right before your mom calls every time? Sorry, uh, uh, Alex, please. Uh, hi, Morgan. Uh, just, to, uh, just to back up a couple of sentences, uh, I like this idea that you're going towards with the idea of synchronicity and there was some recent uh, experiments in an artwork that shows that there's, um, uh, I guess there's a formation of uh, water molecules and ice crystals that uh, respond to uh, how we're thinking. Yes, water has a structure, a physical structure, it's been studied, check it out, and uh, it responds to energetic exchange. In other words, water, so, so we, we talk about polluting the lake, right? Well, what is that? It's introducing a whole bunch of chemicals that kill the, the, the local wildlife. Why? Because it adjusts the code inappropriately. If we knew the code and we amplified the code, well, there's no problem with that. You're just doing what it would naturally have done anyway and facilitating. Good vicegerency, right? But if instead we are altering the code, now suddenly the entire even if you just think about it in terms of chemical and don't even believe in the water having a physical atomic structure, but check it out, there is re serious research on that. Uh, uh, even chemically, boom, you have a different formula. And suddenly it's very difficult to reverse that. Because not, you're not dealing with a kind of a, uh, you're, it's like somebody hacked, like all these uh, uh, agricultural practices have hacked the earth, like figured it out, but ruined it at the same time because not looking at the whole code. It's just like, instead of appropriately programming and really looking into it. But yeah, um, the, the unity of it all is a really important part of it uh, because one cannot necessarily empathize with other until one can empathize with themselves and with the earth. Um, so that's gonna be the journey from this point on is really, um, how do I keep going with this need to express art, to express the inner sensations, and how do I then give that, like give that whole program over to nature so that she can communicate that to us and we can have these visceral experiences, we can have these, uh, you know, changes of mind, you know? So that really is my objective um, for it. Um, I know, I know I kind of spoke really quickly and I was uh, hoping for a larger audience to be able to respond to questions for. So, uh, if, if anybody has any more. Well, it's a small audience. It's okay. So with yeah. the nature work, I have a question. Oh, yes. Sure. What is, what is like your ideal, ideal like goal? Like, what would you like it? visually to look like well it's a sculpture of course because everything yeah. is a sculpture even when i'm programming code i think of it as a sculpture like the key pieces are the armature and then i have to put in some materials from places and then i gotta polish it and then it's a program right um but yeah i, I can see uh this as being a sculpture which i uh you know i, I really love actually a situation like i had at uh, maison de Val when i did uh, the project for concordia the first chainsaw robot this chainsaw robot i didn't build it in a studio and then bring it to the 
gallery. I built it in the gallery. And I, I didn't even really kind of finally know what it was gonna look like until I finally built it. And, and that's one of my favorite quotes too from the research. Uh, it was a, a, an architecture friend of mine, uh, Mark Cozy, Mark Cozy was, uh, um, you know, just a longtime friend, and, and he's, you know, he's one of these uh, South Africans, so he's really intense architecture speaker, but he said the most impressive thing, which is that something is hardly ever designed until it's built. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? so, so it's a sculpture, of course. Obviously, I have been ruminating because I've done 10 years of uh, research on this uh, project specific to this art I'm about to um, try to release here. Um, so, you know, uh, there's tons of uh, technicalities I already know about what needs to be built to make the thing work, but it would be a sculpture for sure. And of course, it couldn't just be a sculpture with materials and not include our best friends because they're going to teach us all the lessons. So most certainly it would be a, a cooperative sculpture, I and some plant. Awesome. And do you have any like partners in mind or anybody that you want to like do the research with or is this a solo project? Uh, no, currently I am working with Chelsea Robinson on this project. She is, is the conceptual artist of this piece and you know I'm like the technical and together when we're negotiating these ideas uh, you know, we've really managed to come to a beautiful place about its potential presentation. Uh, my my uh, sort of uh, desire from all of this is that this gets out into the world, like everything else I've done. So really, once this has been launched, it's going to be decades of research to figure out exactly what went on with it, uh, because it's it going to be quite phenomenal. Um, but the, the idea is something like this. A child grown up without a mother is sad because it missed the touch, the, that. I feel, being one of those, that our earth is feeling the same. Like we're not touching our right. Yeah. So, so my goal is to produce a formula for doing that and then retire <laughs> because who wants to deal with that problem? But um, I think, you know, the, but some of the observations that could be potentially made off of the sculpture are um, the rate at which something grows, or the nutritional value of which something uh, produces. You know, these are the kind of metrics people are going to get excited about because they want to make money. But uh, what I want to do is um, save the fucking planet and feed people. So, um, you know, that's where I'm going with this whole thing. Uh, and so really, I'm only intending on a, a show. Maybe the show will travel and therefore people can get a close look at it and actually experience it and then, and then have what I'm talking about. But um, the implications of this research are well beyond my expertise and well beyond my pay grade. So, uh, you know, once these kind of things get out, once this thing gets out, um, I'm, I'm pretty much just going to leave it up to the research community to take it from there. People that are better than I, I was able to make this part of the uh, observation uh, you know, and I'm 100% confident in it now that I've done 10 years of it. But um, the, the rest of it is not for me. The re I'll just do the next thing. <clears throat> awesome. Yep. Super fascinating. Looking forward to seeing what comes of this. <laughs> awesome. I thank you so much. And I thank everyone else as well. And I kindly ask your forgiveness for late this last time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, sharing with people that during this hard time in COVID, um, if you can, call your mother. And, uh, you know, be good to yourself, get rest, uh, you know, try to get nutrients in that body and love that body. Walk that horse, you know, uh, uh, and, and that's about it. Thanks very kindly for you hearing me. It's a wonderful opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, y'all. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Uh, yep. If you want to play this back or share it, we will have it uploaded onto our YouTube page probably within a couple days here. So, um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you all. Morgan. We'll be Have a good night. <laughs> Bye.